Welcome back to Stories Podcast. I'm your narrator, Kelsey Lee, and today we're finishing up a story we started last week, The Magic Armor, a Max Goodname tale. Enjoy! Max slept fitfully that night, tossing and turning and worrying. It didn't help much that Wallace Q. Wallace was curled up beside him, snoring loudly and muttering strange spells in his sleep. The young wizard was kind enough to let Max share his tent for the night, but it was barely big enough for the two of them and the summer heat was making it stifling. Finally, Max gave up on sleeping and pushed his way out of the tent into the clear summer midnight. Even at the late hour, the fairground was still showing signs of life. Squires and serving men were grumbling over late-night tasks, and a group of knights sat around a fire pit, laughing heartily and passing a horn filled with an amber liquid back and forth across the flames. The moon was a thin crescent in the sky, but the royal guards were walking about with their flickering torches, and it was bright enough to make your way. Max wandered aimlessly, thinking about the tournament in the morning and the risk he was taking. Was it crazy to enter the joust with nothing but the illusion of armor, especially when he had never been in a formal joust before? Yes, yes it was, he decided, but what other choice did he have? He was going to win his knighthood, even if it killed him. So he walked, and he tried to relax and clear his head. Eventually, even the knights stumbled back to their pavilions, and Max was preparing to do the same when he heard a voice calling for help, drowned out by sudden laughter. It was a pretty voice, a young voice, a girl's voice. He ran towards it in the darkness. He came into a small clearing between pavilions lit by hanging lanterns and a thin slice of the moon. In it were three boys and a girl, all about his own age. The boys had stolen a dark bundle from the girl and were throwing it back and forth between them, playing keep away from the girl, frantically trying to recover it. Give it back, she yelled, nearly in tears. You'll hurt him. The boys just laughed. Oh, you'll hurt your little birdie? Asked one mockingly. What kind of weirdo carries an owl around anyway? Laughed another. Without stopping to plan, Max stepped into the flickering light. Hey, why don't you just give that back? The boys turned to look at Max, wide smirks on their face. Yeah? called the one holding the bundle. Who's going to make us? Well, I am. All right, said the thug, and he threw the bundle hard at the girl. We gave it back. Now what are you going to do? Too late. Max did the math and realized three against one wasn't exactly great odds. Now we can all go home. I don't think so, said the thug, and he stepped up and threw a punch high at Max's head. It didn't occur to Max to be afraid. Old Parlo had been throwing punches twice as hard and three times as fast since he first taught Max how to brawl in the dirt. Max ducked the punch and rose with an uppercut, taking the thug off his feet. The other boys came in from the sides, and Max stepped back quickly and knocked their heads together. They fell in a heap on top of the first boy. Max looked down at the boys at his feet and suddenly felt a little more sure of himself. Maybe he did have what it takes to be a knight after all. Not that there was much knightly honor in a midnight brawl, but at least he saved the girl, he thought. The girl! He came upon her sitting on a stump on the fringe of the camp, tears staining her cheeks. She had straight black hair that fell to her shoulders, and her eyes, puffy from crying, were a gray that shone like the silver of his imaginary armor. In her lap, she was cradling a small brown owl with a pure white face whose wing was sticking out at a strange angle. As Max watched, the girl began to sing again, her voice getting stronger as it went and clear as the midnight sky. Spells will mend a broken blade and magic see it sings. A mind will give a body dreams, but love will give it wings. As she sang, the owl began to hoot softly, its wings straightening and smoothing and finally sliding back into its proper shape. The bird nuzzled the girl's hand fondly and then took flight back into the trees. That was amazing, whispered Max. The girl looked over at him with a shy smile. She was short and plump with a friendly heart-shaped face. Thanks, said the girl, but it was nothing really. I'm apprenticing with the clerics at the temple, and they know all kinds of healing spells. They can even save warriors from sword and axe wounds. All I've ever done is fix animals, but one day maybe I'll do more. Max had heard of the clerics and their healing magic, but he had never seen it for himself. 
The most he had ever seen in the past were wandering entertainers, like Wallace Q. Wallace, and even then, only from a distance. No, it was amazing. I wish I could do that. It would make me feel a lot better about tomorrow. Tomorrow? She asked. Are you entering the tournament? You're too young to be a knight, so you must be a squire. Will this be your first joust? I am, and it will. You must be so nervous. The joust is terribly dangerous. That's why my order is here. The clerics say there's always plenty of healing work to be had after a joust. Max felt sick to his stomach with nerves, his face going as pale white as the owl's. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just being terrible. I'm sure you're nervous enough. Max drew himself up again, putting on his bravest voice. I'm not nervous at all. He lied. Though, truth be told, I'd feel better if I knew magic like yours. That way, even if I did get hurt, I could just heal myself right up again. I'm sure you'll be amazing. The way you saved me from those three, I can tell you of the makings of a real hero. The girl rose from the stump and dusted herself off. Tell me your name, and I'll make sure I'm there to watch when they call you, she said shyly. It's Max. Max Goodname. Strange name for a squire. Well, what's your name? I'm Corley, and I need to be getting back to my pavilion. I'm already late as it is. She turned and gave Max one last smile as she walked away. Good luck in the tourney tomorrow, and thanks again, my hero. Thanks! I'm gonna need it. The next morning, Max dressed in his woolen shirt and pants and crude leather boots. Wallace Q. Wallace was devouring a bowl of peppered eggs, but Max was so nervous, he couldn't seem to hold down a single bite. To put a deep ball, said Wallace through a mouthful of eggs. What? said Max, a little irritable. Wallace swallowed and said, You gotta eat, pal. You'll need your strength for the joust. Max grunted and popped a hard-boiled egg into his mouth whole, chewing noisily. Happy? He said, his mouth full of egg. Very said Wallace, rising to his feet, pulling his slender wooden wand out of the baggy blue sleeve of his robe. Now it's time to make the magic happen. He ran through his spell again as Max chewed. Wapow! He finished, hitting Max so hard, he choked and cocked and sprayed all the chewed bits of egg from his mouth. Hey, careful with that. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Max looked down, and he saw that once again he was clad in gleaming silver armor. When he hefted his barrel-top shield and belted on his sword, the only bit of real steel he owned, he looked every inch the well-armored squire. You truly are a miracle worker. It's a gift, said Wallace, buffing his fingernails with his wand. Now let's get you mounted up. They arrived at the jousting yard, Max riding the red warhorse and Wallace walking by his side, just in time to see the first match. Two squires, one armed in black plate and the other in dull gray, faced each other across the muddy expanse of the ground. A low wooden fence ran down the length of the arena, separating the riders so the horses didn't crash into each other during the joust. The herald gave a cry, and the squires both dipped their lances and began their charge. The horses surged forward, and the whole world seemed to tremble with their thunder. The two young men aimed their long lances at each other's shields and brought their own shields in close to block. At the last second, they raised slightly in their stirrups, leaning into the charge and colliding with a great resounding <laughs> The black armored squire swayed in his saddle but kept riding. The gray armored squire wasn't so lucky. His shield slipped at the last moment and his opponent's lance took him full in the chest, sending him flying through the air to land with a sickening crunch in the mud. A few clerics ran out to tend to his injuries as the black squire rode a victory lap around the yard, holding his broken lance high. Max tried to see if Corley was among the clerics in the field, but he couldn't find her. In the next match, the squires both seemed as though they had never hefted a lance before, and it took four passes before one managed to strike the other a glancing blow and knock him from his horse. The herald soon came out to introduce the third match. <laughs> In the north gate, we have Glendon Glaive, squire to the dread knight Sir Garther Glaive, hero of Panther's Pass. The crowd erupted in cheers as Glendon rode his black charger to the north gate. He was clad head to toe in bright red mail that gleamed in the sunlight like glowing embers. Wallace whistled, I'd hate to be the unlucky fellow that has to face him. And in the south gate cried the herald. We have Max Goodname, squire to Parlo the Pink, hero of nothing in particular. The crowd laughed, 
and Max felt his cheeks flush red. Why do you have to say that? You didn't have to say that. Make him pay for it, buddy, said Wallace with a savage grin. Max grinned back, but he didn't feel especially confident. Glendon had clearly been trained well and outfitted better than most knights. All Max had was a little experience jousting against wooden targets or rings with Parlo, and his armor wasn't even real. Still, it was too late to back out now. He kicked his war horse into a trot and headed for the southern gate. As he lined up across the field from Glendon, he saw a young maiden walk towards the handsome young squire, picking her way carefully across the muddy ground. When she reached Glendon, she pulled a ribbon of red silk from her hair and tied it around his bicep. Max felt even worse, as if that were even possible. Glendon had better training, real armor, and a maiden's favor. What chance did Max stand now? Wait, cried a voice from behind him. Max! Max turned to see Corley running up behind him. Max, she said. Wait, there's something I have to give you. She was shaking out a ribbon of her own a pale silver white that matched her cleric's robes. A favor, she said, blushing deeply. A favor, a favor for my hero. She reached up and began to tie the ribbon to Max's arm. He realized too late what she would feel. Max, she yelled as she tightened the ribbon and felt the wool of his shirt against the hard steel he was supposed to be wearing. Shh, said Max quietly. This is the only way, Coralie. Please, don't tell anyone. Max, you'll be killed. Not if I'm good enough, he said. Please, don't do it. I can only heal wings and beaks, Max. No one can bring you back if Glendon gets you with that lance. I will be a knight, said Max in reply. Fine. If you insist on being so pig-headed, then you'll at least take this. And then she sang softly, pretending to adjust the ribbon on his arm as she did it. Mother, hold your children tight. Father, guard them well. Smith for true, the armor bright, and temples peel your bells. Callous hands swing sure your swords, arms hold high your shields. The true steel has its own rewards, the true steel never yields. Max felt something wash over him as Corley sang the words. It seemed to ease slowly over his body like a warm bath, seeping through his skin and bones and nestling down in his heart. What? What was that? A protective spell. It's called a ward. A ward for my hero. And with that, she turned and hurried away, her long silver robes flapping in the breeze. Combat's ready, cried the herald. Glendon took a lance from the rack and dipped it at Max, and Max did the same. Charge, cried the herald. Max kicked his red into a charge, and Glendon did the same with his black. Time seemed to slow and Max leveled his lance with his opponent's bright red shield. He brought up the barrel that across his body, like Parlo had shown him. Cover your heart and guts, boy, else you like to lose both, the sour old knight would say. Glendon suddenly loomed huge. He was twenty feet away, ten feet away, five feet away. <laughs> Max reeled in his saddle as Glendon's lance glanced off the barrel lid. His own lance struck true, crashing into Glendon's shield and lifting the red-armored squire from his saddle and sending him crashing to dust. Max had won. He could hardly believe it, and either could the crowd. There was a stunned silence, and then a single voice rang out, Good name. Good name. The entire crowd picked it up, a thousand voices chanting, Good name. Good name. Good name. Max rode a wide circle around the arena, lance held high. Good name, good name, good name. The day went on, and the field of squires brave enough to joust got smaller. It shrank from eight to four, and finally, it was down to just Max and one other. Max was feeling confident. His second match went even better than the first. His opponent, the squire in the black armor that had won the first tilt of the day, completely missed Max with a hastily swung lance and Max unhorsed him almost effortlessly, not getting so much as a scratch. The ward was working, Max realized. Corley's protective spell was keeping him safe, and his skill with the lance was doing the rest. I will be a knight, he said, and for the first time, he actually believed it. From the North Gate! 
cried the herald. We have Max Goodname! The crowd cheered loudly. For the final match, everyone had turned out to see who would win their knighthood. The king and queen could be seen sitting high above the rest, on twin thrones carved from polished ivory and ebony. On the queen's knee, the royal princess bounced and gurgled happily. And from the south gate, we have Reynard Roan. The crowd went absolutely wild. They were fond of Max for winning unlikely victories as an unheard-of squire. But Reynard was cousin to the queen and squiring for the king's own brother. He was tall and fair and clad all in golden armor, and the favors of no fewer than four maidens were tied around each arm. He took up his lance and hollered at Max from across the field. "'You've had a fair showing, good name, but I am the one who will win my knighthood today.' "'Come win it, then,' Max said, and spurred his horse across the muddy field. Reynard matched his charge, and for Max, all else faded away. The sounds of the crowd dimmed to silence, his horse's hooves blurred to nothing, his entire world became his lance and shield and the foe ahead of him and his savage will to win. His opponent neared, Max raised up, barrel-led shield held high, lance leveled with his opponent's chest. True steel has its own rewards. True steel never yields. Pain, pain more intense than any Max had ever known. He managed to stay in his saddle, but he wasn't sure how. When he got to the end of the field, he looked down and saw a foot-long splinter of wood sticking out of his leg. When Reynard's lance shattered against the barrel-lid shield, he must have caught one of the pieces. Looking over his shoulder, he saw Reynard laughing and hefting a new lance. Max hadn't even scratched him. Nasty splinter you've got there! Do you yield, sir? True steel never yields. I'll never yield! Let's go again! Max pulled the splinter from his leg with a wince. They both took fresh lances and charged. This time, Reynard's lance smashed Max's shield to splinters, and it fell ruined to the mud. Max's lance just glanced off Reynard's shield and with a weak thump. You've no shield, good name, called Reynard. Yield before you're hurt. No shield, thought Max to himself glumly. Try no shield and no armor. He felt suddenly very naked, sitting on his horse with nothing but his wool shirt and pants and rough leather boots. He should yield. There was no dishonor in it. Shieldless and armless as he was, but then he may never be a knight. I will be a knight, said Max for the final time. Once more, Reynard, Max called, grabbing a fresh lance from the rack. You're brave. Dumb, but brave. One more then, good name. There was a sudden small commotion in the crowd. Max looked over and saw the three thuggish boys from the night before. They had Corley again, pulling her bodily through the crowd. Max looked on helplessly from his spot inside the arena. He couldn't leave without forfeiting the match, and even if he left, he would never slip through the crowd on his horse. Wallace! He cried, and the wizard appeared at the gate. That girl, the cleric in the silver! He pointed her out. Go help her! I'll be there after the tilt. Max, cried Wallace. I can't get her and maintain the illusion. I'm already struggling as it is with all these hits you've been taking. I don't care. Just don't let them hurt her. Wallace saw the passion in Max's eyes and shaking his head, ran off through the crowd, preparing some bit of magic to help the dark-haired girl with the silver robes. Max roared and spurred on the great red war horse. Across the yard, Reynard did the same and the field was full of the ragged thunder of horses' hooves and screaming men. Max was vaguely aware that the illusion of his armor had faded away, but he didn't care. He needed to finish this match one way or another so he could go and help Corley. The two squires seemed to fly at each other, one a crimson blur in winking steel and the other a strange streak of brown wool. They came together, and the earth seemed to shake and tremble with the power of their crash. Reynard's lance glanced off Max's arm, but Max's lance struck Reynard full in the chest, just above the shield and just below the helmet. The lance bent like a bow and then snapped straight, launching Reynard like an arrow. He flew a full fifteen feet before landing in the mud before the king. Max had won, but he didn't care. Across the field, he saw Wallace brawling with two of the thugs. The third was holding Corley and laughing at the skinny wizard's efforts. He urged his horse into a gallop, and they cleared the arena fence in a single mighty jump. Enough, 
yelled Max as he rode up to Corley and the thugs and swung down off his horse. You let them go before I give you more of what you got last night. Two of the thugs looked nervous, but the leader only stepped forward. Last night he was dressed in plain wool, same as Max, but today he had on his full squire outfit, including thick leather armor and a short sword of notched steel, honed to a razor edge. This isn't fists, this is steel and your wizard is out of the fight, the thug said, drawing his sword. You sure you'd like to try me with wood and cheap illusions? You'll find my steel is true enough, coward, said Max, drawing his own sword with a steely hiss. That's a chance I'm willing to take, said the thug. Take it then, growled Max, and the dance began. They clashed and clashed again and again. The thug's sword came in high, and Max got up his own blade in response, and the impact was the bright song of metal on metal, and the thug realized the truth in Max's words. His armor and his shield may have been fake, but his sword was the true steel. The fight raged on, and now everyone in the stands was watching, including the king and queen. Royal guards were shouting and heading towards them, but they wouldn't make it in time, Max realized. This would be decided by the blade. The thugs pressed forward. Max gave ground, but remembered the advice of old Parlo. Sword fighting's about more than swords, boy. Never forget it. I've seen many a good knight fall because they forgot all about the fist and foot and knee and teeth and... And Max let the thug swing in hard and then hooked him behind the knee with a kick, sending him stumbling. As he staggered past, Max clubbed him along the back of the head with a pummel of his sword, and the thug sank to the ground like he'd been hit with a sleeping spell. The other two thugs scattered, and Max went over to Corley, picking her up gently from the ground. You saved me. Again. Well, I owed you. Without your ward, I wouldn't have been able to make it through the tournament. Oh, Max, I don't know any wards. But the song. Corley laughed and planted a kiss on Max's cheek. Oh, my sweet hero, I made it up. You just look so nervous. I thought you could use a little faith. Made it up? And then Max lost consciousness. In the end, it took Corley and three other clerics to bring Max around again. He was bleeding from where the lance splinter stuck in his leg and from a dozen other small cuts. His arm had been broken where Reynard shattered his shield and made worse by the final lance blow. But luckily, Corley was an expert at healing wings, and it proved to be that arms weren't so different after all. Once Max had been patched up and revived, they brought him in front of the king and queen. Max Goodname, thundered the king. You have won the tournament and your knighthood. He stepped down off the throne and drew his great golden sword. Kneel for the last time as a squire. Max knelt. There was a deep silence in the arena. Squire, bellowed the king. I dub thee Sir Max Goodname, Knight of North End, protector of the Northern Realms, and defender of the weak. Rise, Sir Knight. Max rose to his feet, and the crowd cheered loudly. After a moment, the king raised his hand for silence. What's more, in light of the extreme bravery you showed by entering the tournament with nothing but a barrel lid and a handful of conjurer's magic, I gift you a new suit of silver armor from the royal blacksmith. Wear it well! The crowd erupted again, but again the king called for silence. To the young cleric apprentice Corley, who saved your life, said the king. I award the title of Master Cleric! The crowd cheered briefly before being quieted by the king yet again. And as for your wizard friend, who so deceived the court. Wallace Q. Wallace suddenly looked very nervous. I give him 1,000 cogs, the title of Grand Illusionist of North End, and a stern warning to never, ever pull a stunt like that again. The crowd's cheering redoubled, and this time the king let it go on and on. Wallace and Corley ran to Max, and the three of them, knight, cleric, and wizard, embraced in the center of the arena. And that was their first adventure, though it was by no means their last. The End Thanks for listening! 